right, so we're going to talk about antibody databases and how that can help uh, decision making, et cetera. And the other good news is there's an open or cash bar at the surf and sand. But you must stay. It's not open until 8.45. So I'm Karen Paget with Biotechni. I run the antibody business unit at Biotechni, which is R&D Systems and Novus. And we have a panel here that's going to talk about databases. I'm going to introduce the group, and then they're each going to give a short presentation on what their site will do. And then we'll have some discussion. So first we have Anita Bandrovsky from SciCrunch. And we have Andrew Chalmers from SciDab, Cecilia Linskog from Human Protein Atlas, Michael Okamoto from BioCompare, and Han Xia from Labo. And we'll start with Anita, and she can give a little introduction. Okay. Thank you. Um, do I get a slide? Yes! I got a slide. Okay, very good. Um, so, uh, Hi, my name is Anita, and I do RRIDs, and that is what the antibody registry does. It just, I don't know, how many people know what a DOI is? Okay, good. It's like a DOI, but for antibodies, it's very nice. Um, so what are the kind of features of an, an RRID? Well, what it does is it uniquely identifies a particular product, and um, it can be given out, and it can be actually taken uh, and pulled by antibody companies, such as you know half of you in this room. So here are two antibody companies that actually do something very nice, which is uh, reflecting back the RRID on their own websites and in their material data sheets. So there are other antibody companies that also do this, but um, I didn't have that much room on one slide. So um, these are great, and the reason that this is great is because this gives a two-way verification. And this, this idea of the two-way verification is really critical because what we're asking the author to do once you know, they're done with their antibody experiment, like um, you know, this, this one here, um, and hopefully there are less flames in most of your antibody experiments. But anyway, so once the scientist is done with their experiment, they want to cite that antibody, and they're being asked by the lovely publishers, some of them you'll be hearing from tomorrow, to provide this RRID. But if they've never heard of this thing before, then it's really, really, really super nice for them to go back to the vendor site and actually see that because then they said, oh, okay, that's the ID. I understand. So there's this really nice two-way verification. So anyway, the antibody um, gets cited by the, the author, and um, the reason that that happens is because the author is really passionate about it at sometimes, and sometimes it happens because, more often, because um, the uh, particular journal or the, the publisher actually has instructions to authors or they actually really push for that um, RID adoption. And then what ends up happening, and I don't know if you can see any of this, but um, then the paper comes out and it has links that are inside of the paper itself. And those are um, these links to RIDs. In the case of um, various publishers, eLife, they just have live links. Um, in, in Elsevier, um, they actually have created this little antibody app which pulls our data. So if your data is in this antibody app and it looks like um, it's terrible, well, that's my fault, right? And the, the good news is you can fix that by talking to me. So um, what we want to be able to do is then just essentially the readers of the papers, all of the antibody citations actually get pulled out onto these side panels from at least from Elsevier papers. Um, this can also happen in others. Um, um, but what happens is then that can go on to the vendor site or it can go back to our site depending on um, what happens uh, and, and where those links are. So basically this is what we do. It's just, it's like a DOI, digital object identifier, but it's for antibodies. And um, the whole thing will work much better if more journals, more vendors, and more scientists get to use it because we're building lots of tools to be able to help support this ecosystem, um, but it will only work 
if lots and lots of people join. So the question has been raised before, um, earlier in the sessions, that's not really a unique identifier. That's the, one of the things I'm looking for here, and so I'm very excited about the sessions tomorrow because I'm hoping that we can get that closer to an actual unique identifier. Um, but, you know, I will go with whatever the consensus is. For the moment, we have a system that works. And we're very, very excited about it. So, thanks. Well, so, so what's been brought up before is that, um, oh, oh, oh. So uh, the question was, what do you mean it's not a unique identifier? Um, and the, the answer to that question is, well, sometimes there might be two vendors who sell the same antibody. And so those will get different IDs. Um, so at the moment, those are two different IDs and it really hopefully would eventually be one because we would wanna be able to actually trace the entire provenance of a particular product. So that's half the problem. Is the other half problem solved? That is, the lot number is included in the RID now? Uh, we encourage strongly the authors to use lot information. Separately from the RID. You mean the RRID does not include the lot number? No. And is there, can that be done? Or is that? Yes, it can be done. My <coughs> Um, can you say that again slowly? <laughs> the idea of lot numbers, is it most important for polyclonals or is it also important so. for hybridoma soups as well as recombinant preps? Well, well, look, here's the problem. Some antibody vendors on the polyclonal side, let's just look at those guys, retire a catalog number every time their lot is done, right? And now, is that the right thing to do according to me? Great, that's the right thing to do. If Roberto wants to say this is absolutely exactly, and here's the proof that 9101 is exactly the same as the one that they came up with in 2009, and he stands up here and he shows you that Western blot, great. Um, I would rather that they retire the catalog numbers, but I am not in control of that, right? So I know that there's a lot of <coughs> vendors that do that. Some don't. Um, so ideally, the lot to lot variability would be, would be much smaller um, if the catalog numbers were retired. We can change things, but I'm also looking to this group to figure out what the consensus is and what I should do. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, the, going down to the conversation we had this morning, yeah. that really the unique reagent is down to the lot. It's, yeah. So it, it seems like you are in control of what goes into that standard. You're yeah. not in control of a lot of vendors retiring or not retiring catalog numbers. So it yes. seems to me that this, if this is one recommendation that we could come up with here, that actually an RRID characterizes a reagent to the lot number. And yes, we will have redundancy. There will be multiple RRIDs for the same reagent, but if at least we could not have one RRID representing several different reagents, I think we would have already made one step forward. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And, and I think the standard is a big step forward. Mm -hmm. Maybe one follow-on question on that. Yeah. If, if that would be, would be the case, that RID would be um, um, put together to the, to the lots, then basically over time these RIDs are linking to non-existing products all the time. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But what, what's the purpose of this then? <laughs> well, if you look behind you, there's a journal editor right there. <coughs> now, the question is, is the publication ever going to change? The answer is no, right? The publication is a record of a thing in time. It's like you can think of it as a rock. That rock isn't gonna change. But if you look at all of your catalogs, it's like a river, right? 
I actually tracked one antibody through Sigma Aldrich over about three years, and it had gone up and down, right? So the GFAP antibody from Sigma, uh, you know, there were 40 reagents, and then six months later, there were 45 reagents, and then six months later, there were 42 reagents, and you're like, what happened to those? And then there were 50 reagents, and, and you know, if the, if the journal is just getting the information that it's a GFAP from Sigma, you have absolutely no idea whether that product is even sold anymore. So if you get the RRID, and I know that RRID123 corresponds to GFAP from Sigma, and that GFAP is catalog number X, right? At least we have that. I would love to get the lot from everybody, but I'm not gonna get it. Even Cliff Saber doesn't get the lot number from everybody, and he like jumps up and down, and he's really mean. <laughs> Actually, is he here? I haven't seen him yet. He didn't come, no. Um, so, you know, we can, we can ask the author to do what they're willing and able to do, and then we can do that backstop for the journals, because the journals say this is the thing that this person bought, and so we can say, here's the thing that existed at one time, it is gone, we've documented that it's gone in 2012. Yeah, that's, that's nice, but it doesn't really help to, to solve the reproducibility crisis, right? The idea to, I, I thought that one of the ideas is to have the possibility to actually track the actual reagent, get yes. it in order to repeat an experiment. Absolutely, if the, if the reagent is still sold, it'll track it. If the reagent is no longer sold, it can still be in somebody's freezer. And it can be there for 10 years, 20 years. Many of these things still are. So you can put out calls and say, hey, I need to reproduce this study. Does anyone have one? And we can try to track that because we would know over time which labs actually use that product. So Akim, you work with recombinant antibodies, so you don't understand this like I don't understand it. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, if everything was recombinant, you'd be able to go back 30, 40, 50 years and get the same antibody. Yeah, unless your antibody uh, uh, database dies with your recombinant <laughs> sequence in it. <laughs> Hopefully not, right. This is it. So yes, ideally with recombinants, this wouldn't be a problem. You would never have to retire a thing. But in the polyclonal world, you're going to have to retire. But it's so much better to know that the thing is retired, as opposed to now, you don't even know what the thing is. OK, let's move on. To Thank things. you. Sorry for taking so long. meeting but to be able to talk to you all about Cytab so that's sort of perfect for, for me. So Cytab essentially is a giant database of antibody citations where we look at specific products used in the peer-reviewed literature and then we use that database for two main purposes. We use it to drive the antibody search engine which I'll come back to um, and then secondly we use it to generate um, aggregated data sets for suppliers to help suppliers so in terms of the search engine, pressing the wrong button. That. That. So then, that, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, so in terms of the search engine, it's got two really key features that we, we built in from the beginning, um, which is that we want to try to list every antibody we can so we don't charge to, to list. And then secondly, we treat every antibody in exactly the same the way. It doesn't matter who, who makes them to us, we treat, treat them all exactly the same. And we rank them by the number of times they've been cited in the um, peer-reviewed scientific literature. And our sort of um, reason for doing that is that we feel that that provides the best starting point for researchers to quickly find a number of antibodies that might be of interest that they can then take into their lab and, and validate. So um, be because they've been used um, in, in independent labs. In terms of 
specifically down to validation, it also means we've got this large library of citations where researchers have used antibodies and, and we know that what researchers are doing is looking through them to find publications that are really close to their areas of interest or applications of interest and then they can dig into those papers to find um, what, was there any validation done in that paper, does it actually provide any useful information and hopefully um, at least start their experiments from as informed position as they, as they can be. Um, and then secondly, we again, as I mentioned, we use the data in aggregated form to provide to suppliers to help um, guide their validation so they can see what, for example, applications might be most useful for researchers, to, um, what, which ones are most commonly used for particular protein targets, so that then they can help make their validation as efficient as possible for, um, for the people that buy their antibodies. We were asked about, about limitations of the database, and, and, and our main limitation is, is very deliberate, which is that we focus entirely on um, citations, so we don't, we're not attempting to try and do everything. And that was a very deliberate um, from the beginning, which was the idea was it was a search engine where users could quickly find a, a few different antibodies that might be of interest, and then migrate to the supplier's website to get all the information. We didn't attempt to reproduce that. So what's been really exciting is that recently we've been working with third, party, um, third parties to use the data on their own websites and so this can be um, antibody suppliers and so we're delighted to be providing the data to suppliers. So there they've carried out their own validation and they can add the citations that we find um, alongside their own validation to show that those um, products have been used in the peer-reviewed literature and, and provide a kind of independent guide and also an information resource as I mentioned to their users. Um, and again, an, uh, another example which we hadn't really anticipated was um, other, other platforms which all have different approaches and different strengths. So uh, Fluorofinder and Chromosite, which will be well known the flow cytometrists in the audience, are platforms that help build panels of antibodies for flow cytometry. They now have links to Cytab. So again, they have all their own strengths which Cytab would never attempt to mirror and they can integrate our data into um, their search results to help researchers um, or provide a, a better service to researchers in terms of finding and selecting antibodies. And for me, from like a personal point of view, one of the things which I hope to get out of this meeting and is exciting is to come up with new ideas of where we can use the citation data in other, other services to help researchers in ways we haven't anticipated. Good question. I, I was told strictly five minutes, so <laughs> but you've given me a chance to talk for at least another five minutes, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so we do a lot of our own text mining, um, and so we, 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 um, we're getting very good at finding citations ourselves. We also get information from suppliers, so if they've found citations, um, then we can get them in batches and, and validate them. And then also from users adding, um, there's places where users can easily add citations onto from the site. Pull them together. So, um, two questions. First of all, how do you how do you know a citation for an individual antibody is for that antibody and doesn't overlap with the same antibody that you have in a separate category, or that that you have two antibodies that are inadvertently grouped into the same category of or the same citation? That is, what's your unique identifier? The IRID. I get that. That's a unique identifier. How, what do you use in place of that? So we use the, um, um, in many cases, it's a combination of company and catalogue code, which is effectively in what an RID is based on now. Um, and you know, it would be better when you can aggregate them together and that. Um, so it's, so we, we only put it in where we can, uh, and that's completely not trivial, as you can imagine, to, to extract um, that information on a huge scale. Um, so um, we work very hard to be able to link them together, and we don't put them in if we can... Um, if you can't identify a unique product, then we won't go into Cytab effectively. So it, it might well be that there are publications that we don't have which use an antibody, but it's no good if you can't tell. As Anita mentioned, if there's 50 antibodies, then... 
just a follow up to you. Um, how do you, so if something gets a lot of citations, we talked about this a little offline, yeah. even if the anybody doesn't validate, do you have any way to censor it or this is just, you just call them as you see them? We, we um, yeah, deliberately call it as we see them, which is not, it, it isn't the perfect approach, but I think as a first pass, it's probably the best approach that there is. Um, and the key really is that researchers, so effectively, um, researchers can see the antibodies on the market and they can look at when the citations are from and they can make those decisions about um, if a new antibody comes along which um, you know I think specificity is going to be a key isn't it so if a new antibody comes along and an old antibody is shown to be um, non-specific then it's a major driver for people to switch and, and that will show up in the sort of the, the, the where publications are and, and of course as researchers migrate to the suppliers website then they'll make that that clear. So I actually think that it's, science is a very social activity and citation, it would be nice to believe that citation indicated either quality or validation or functionality. I don't think it does. I think it's all to do with, uh, with first mover advantage, with first publications and I think that uh, some antibody manufacturers have taken advantage of that and used that as a business model. And so you could almost argue that you actually have been facilitating them by providing them with additional advertising. See, yeah, see, I don't, I don't buy that, and um, <laughs> not surprisingly, because I wouldn't be here if I did. But, <laughs> um, and I think the thing is that before Cytab came along, that was how people were selecting antibodies. We saw the survey data that, um, what was you know, very interesting about that is that publications even came above um, you know, lab mates across the corridor, which, um, and that was happening before Cytab. But before Cytab, if there was a thousand citations for an antibody and one citation for the second antibody in the market, nobody would ever see that second antibody. Now, what they see is they see the top antibody of a thousand, but the second antibody of one. And people do look, we see people look around um, at a number of antibodies, so it, it definitely helps. And what it avoids is there's, um, you know, you can argue about specificity, but if an antibody is being used a lot and is constantly causing problems and people will look around for other reagents and they will switch and that will be shown up. But, but more it was designed to solve this problem where you just buy an antibody and you get absolutely no signal at all. Um, and at least if it's been used in multiple publications, I think you've got much less of a chance of that happening. And that's what you know, we found in my lab and that's why we started Sitab and, and that's the feedback we get from you know, many users that it, it's increasing their chances of success compared to Googling and finding the top hit, which often will be, um, you know, a mixture of companies and may not be the ones with the best validation. And so, yeah, that's what. And so here's our last question. Uh, quick question: What is the landing from protocols? Um, what is the business model? So yeah, again, it's sort of a good, um, a good question. Thank you for. Uh, um, so. Yeah, because we don't, we don't charge to list and we clearly don't charge users to use it. So the, the way we make money is, is by um, providing data to, to suppliers, really, is this the business model. So that can be aggregated um, data and then also specific um, data on citations. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to talk about Human Protein Atlas project, and the aim is to localize all the proteins on the tissue, cell, and organelle level. We do that with immunohistochemistry <coughs> chemistry on tissues, and we use tissue microarrays and paraffin and better material. And then we also have immunofluorescence, and then we do work on cell lines. We use polyclonal antibodies. And all the data is then publicly available on the website proteinatlas.org. It's being extensively used with more than 100,000 visitors per month. And the data that we show there is an overview of the protein expression across a large set of different tissues. It's from 44 different normal tissues, 20 types of cancer, and we also have the possibility to look at the resolution of the protein expression inside a cell. Uh, 20 different organelles 
And you can search for a certain protein by its name, but we also gather data into different groups of proteins according to functions. You can uh, look at proteins certainly expressed in a specialized tissue and so on, and different uh, knowledge chapters. Uh, we believe that we contribute to validation of research antibodies by uh, being open and make everything publicly available. We have currently uh, data for 84% of all the human proteins, uh, which is more than 16,000 proteins with at least one antibody. And we provide the sequence of the antigen that we have uh, uh, generated the antibody towards, uh, different validation data, the protocol that we have been using, uh, the validation, and uh, we then also have uh, internal scores, how we uh, explain how we rely on the data. So we uh, gather everything into antibodies that we think are supportive and antibodies that we believe are uncertain. And that is done for every application. So an antibody can be supportive for immunohistochemistry chemistry in tissue, but uncertain in uh, cell lines and so on. Um, and we have then also all the primary data for 25,000 antibodies and that corresponds to 30 million images because we have uh, almost 600 images that we provide for each antibody. So we have both the data shown as levels and scores that we have looked at each image manually but we then also uh, provide the images so that all researchers can look themselves in every cell type exactly how the protein is expressed. One of the challenges that we're facing is that it is a subjective assessment uh, in many of the parameters. So for the tissues we have pathologists or uh, specially educated personnel that look at each cell type manually and we still believe that that is the best way uh, so far for the results that we want to achieve to uh, generate a detailed map how the protein is expressed in these complex tissues with a lot of cell types. Uh, but for antibody validation we are now discussing how we can make this less subjective and also when we want to compare the staining pattern between two independent antibodies, how we can uh, calculate that in some way, more than just saying that it's an identical staining pattern, since we also have 44 different tissues to look at, and what exactly is an identical staining pattern, how much can it differ, or should it be exactly identical in all of the tissues, and so on. So that we're discussing a lot right now. Uh, we're focusing uh, a lot of, on antibody quality in general, so we're Restaining antibodies with other dilution, uh, replacing and removing some antibodies that we uh, think should be removed due to quality reasons. And uh, we will also continue to add more uh, tissue types uh, to identify proteins that are not covered by this standard set of tissues and so on. And uh, in the next release that will be in December this year, we are planning to adapt to these five pillars that are suggested by uh, the International Working Group for Antibody Validation and uh, see how we can uh, validate our antibodies according to these pillars. Uh, so we will still show our internally generated scores, how we believe in the antibodies, but then also adapt to these guidelines and show which ones that are validated according to EUGAV. And uh, we believe that we will have around 5,000 antibodies in the next release that we can put a stamp on that it's validated in at least one of those pillars. Any questions? So, um, it, I didn't show it, but we've had experience in our lab where depending on the the concentration of the antibody you use, you change the subset of the localization of the event. That is what's, what's where the signal is. It may have to do with cross-reactivity, that at a certain concentration you're seeing something in the nucleus and then you dilute out and see something on the membrane. How do you know that when you, do, when you assign these antibodies to locations that you aren't subject to that and do you test for that? 
Uh, the hardest thing is that there are not so many proteins that are completely uncharacterized, almost one third of the proteins. Uh, and if there's no literature to compare with at all, uh, of course you can have a bioinformatic prediction. So if there's a transmembrane region, you could guess that it should be membranous and so on. Uh, but to be able to know it, some kind of differential expression where how much we should dilute then we need to compare with other data sets yeah. you do a, you do a, some sort of visual titer optimization yes over how many logs what do you how say? many what log range is it two two logs or how, what dynamic range over which do you titer um, we always start with a certain dilution depending on the protein concentration and then we uh, usually diluted two or three times. So, <coughs> difference. So, so, I mean, like, so one to a hundred to one to a thousand, that's one log. How many log range do you do? It depends on how it looks. So we don't uh, measure it in them. How do you deal with splice variation? Uh, we generate antibodies towards one major isoform of each protein, uh, but uh, of course there can be different uh, splice variants. Uh, we haven't looked much into that yet, but we're planning for the future also to uh, get more of that information. Uh, but of course if we have independent antibodies and they go towards different isoforms, then we cannot expect them to be similar in the staining pattern. A hypothetical question. How would the human protein atlas be used differently if we had monoclonals with defined sequence that could then be used in fundamental mechanistic biology beyond just detection of a vast array of human proteins? Um. We decided from the start to go for polyclonal antibodies because they uh, work in all the different assays that we want to use. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer your question, <laughs> sorry. Last question. I have a question. That there has been recently um, a publication about proteome-wide mass-spec analysis of proteins from certain cell lines. Have you ever tried to correlate your data with the data from this mass-spec databases? Um, yes, uh, or, or at least we did a, a collaboration where we looked at RNA sequencing data that we have generated and then also did mass spec on, on the same samples. Um, but we haven't really looked at the, the protein uh, data and compared that with mass spectrometry. You hear me? Oh, it's working. Okay, you guys are almost there. It's just me and Han. Thank you for uh, sticking around at the end of a very long, hot day. Um, would it be possible to get the, the second version of the slide that I, I sent you? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, for those of you uh, who, who don't uh, know me or, or know BioCompare, my name is Michael Kivado. I'm the Chief Content Officer and a co-founder of BioCompare. Uh, BioCompare is a product directory. Essentially what we do is we aggregate product information from, from over 400 different suppliers uh, and we put it all into one space, uh, one site, to make it easy for researchers to find the products that they're interested in. We currently have um, close to 7 million products on the site as a whole, about a little less than half of them, about a little over three million of those are antibodies. And those antibodies come from uh, just over 200 different suppliers. So we have uh, a pretty big antibody database. Um, and it's used by over 
just over two million researchers uh, per year. Um, the, the researchers can come to the site, they can search for antibodies using our cleverly named antibody search tool. Um, within the tool, obviously, they can search by application, by target, um, et cetera, et cetera. And once they find uh, a, a list of, of antibodies that might, uh, that might fit their, their search criteria, they can compare them based on specifications. Um, we do have citations, I don't think quite as extensive as, as Andrew and um, but we did acquire uh, a text mining company a couple of years ago, so we do, uh, we do have uh, citation information. Um, but really what I'm here to talk about are the, the efforts that we put around product reviews. And so, I think yesterday um, we were, we mentioned, or somebody mentioned, the, the concept of, you know, is there an Amazon or a Yelp-like functionality out there that, that researchers can go and, and rate uh, reviews, or I'm sorry, rate antibodies. Uh, and, and the answer is yes, uh, there is. BioCompare does have product reviews. I, I would say these are actually different from Amazon and Yelp in that um, we ask very specific questions when it comes to uh, antibody, to the antibodies. Uh, one, all of the reviews are att attributed, so we need to make sure that the other end of this review is, is a researcher. Um, and then we ask very specific questions about how they use the antibody, right? So what was the application that they used? What was your sample? What was your primary incubation? What was your diluent? What was your blocking agent? What, what did you use for your secondary incubation? And um, from that, I think we have pulled together a, a pretty good database of, of, it's not quite validation as it is you know, to, to, to this audience, but it is a pretty good starting point, we think, for, for researchers to compare and contrast antibodies. Um, the biggest hurdle that we face with with our reviews, however, is scale, right? We, as was mentioned yesterday, these things don't just go viral. It's not something that uh, you know you can put up and all of a sudden every researcher in, in the world is going to going to come and submit a review on their favorite antibody. So um, that is that is kind of a, a challenge that we've been facing. Um, we actually have, in the past uh, two years, we, we've begun to devote uh, resources. We have somebody now who is full time. Their entire job is going out and beating the bushes and trying to get researchers to, uh, to submit reviews. And it's worked. So, uh, you know, two, two to three years ago, we were getting 25 reviews a month, something like that, 25, between 25 and 50. We're, we're now getting between 200 and 250 reviews a month, which we think is, is a pretty good number. We'd like to get more. Um, but again, it does come back to, to the the, uh, the question of scale, you know, if we have 3 million antibodies, how long is it going to take us to get meaningful coverage at 250 uh, reviews a month? Probably a little while, but I'm a patient man, and, uh, and uh, I'm willing to get it out as best as we can. Uh, so that's really it. That is, that is BioCompare, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes? So when you ask for users to review, are there guidelines that they're given about how to review? I mean, what is it that they're supposed to comment on and how do they make their judgments? So it, it's an editorial process. Um, we have a template that they need to fill out, research overview, um, which you, know, you can see here. Um, these, all of these, uh, you know, th it's almost a form basically, right? What was your application? What was your incubation time, et cetera? Uh, but it is editorial in that we have, the, we have somebody that reads every single review and communicates back with the reviewer to, to verify all of that information. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard to do with a glass of wine in your hand. <laughs> so, um, do you know uh, all the an duplicate antibodies? Is that something you can address here? I mean, because three million, I mean, I've heard various estimates. I've heard that it's about actually three million antibodies from all those 200 supplies actually represents probably 100 to 200,000 unique antibodies. I don't know what your estimate of that is, but uh, 
uh, perhaps you could provide that estimate and perhaps you could also tell us if that's something you can solve. I know there's a lot of reluctance to try and fix this in the antibody supply community. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, so I have not taken a deep dive into that question. I've taken a couple of shallow passes at it. And what I have looked at is, is there any way that I can identify unique antibodies just based on, on the data that's being provided to us by, by the suppliers? Uh, and the short answer is no. There's... It's... Right, so the, 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 the question is, if you look at uh, the antibody product information, you can actually see very similar information across different suppliers, and, and the idea is that that originated from one company, um, and that just that that information gets propagated across uh, across the internet. Um, you know, it, it <laughs> maybe I, maybe I should uh, rephrase this. When I've looked at it, and, and keep in mind, I'm I'm not a, a programmer, um, but I, I've taken some some. You know, I've, I've spent some time looking at this data, and it is, it is not trivial, and I have not been able to see reproducible patterns of, okay, this antibody is coming from this, you know, it's the same as this, this, and this, and, and so, you know, short answer is I don't have any more insight into exactly how many unique individual antibodies that three million represents. Two things. One is uh, the database we are building, and the second thing is that actually have a proposal for the um, unique identifiers for for everybody. Um, several of you mentioned so, um, uh, a bit of history. Um, when I first started about uh, in 2002, uh, I was uh, back then it was uh, SARS. So I had this idea that uh, if I organize all the antibodies and uh, with their aptos and putting them into a database, if there is an uh, unknown uh, virus, a DNA sequence will be known in about 24 hours, and uh, if we have this database, immediately it will be figured out which antibody, um, antibodies may be able to cross-react to this unknown pathogen. Um, that, that, um, that uh, idea um, didn't result uh, in anything meaningful, but it ended up with a database uh, with the monoclonal antibodies and their after itself who provides uh, those antibodies. So I asked uh, several suppliers, I say, I have this database, it's well organized, it's mapped to a particular gene ID, and uh, if they are willing to give me some money, so I have a website and everybody can search for it. And uh, several suppliers says, fine, they are willing to pay me for it. And so after I established that website, it's initially called Exact Antigen. Uh, so a lot of people like, liked the website because it was the first to use the gene ID to organize the antibodies. Um, but they, all, they, have, they raised a very interesting question. It's a, uh, they asked, uh, you list a lot of antibodies, but how do I know which antibody will actually work? So uh, the first thing I thought would be, well, I asked for NIH, submit a grant to do, to do high throughput Western blood, which I did. Um, it, didn't, uh, it didn't result any funding, so I did the next best thing, I think, is go read the articles, which means, uh, uh, we have manually read the articles and pull out which antibodies have been used in which article, in, uh, in which species sample, and uh, in which method. Um, since then, we have, uh, we have gone through about 50,000 articles to build a database with uh, 200,000 um, specific applications 
it covered, the database covers so far 50,000 antibodies. So they are still not unique. And uh, it had, uh, those antibodies are from uh, 167 suppliers and uh, uh, the samples covers 398 species. So uh, the advantage of this uh, database is, of course, it can uh, establish the specificity of the commonly used antibodies. And there are a couple of extra benefits. One is that we, uh, we can identify new reactive species beyond what suppliers have identified in their validation. The second is, of course, we also identify new antibody applications. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the all data is uh, freely accessible from lab on our website. And uh, um, there are, there are um, I think there are three problems with uh, uh, this antibody irreversibility. Uh, reproducibility uh, problem. One is uh, relabeling. The second one is uh, the specificity of antibodies. The third one it will be the catalog problem of the polyphenols. And uh, hopefully, this data, uh, database can help identify the um, specificity of very commonly used antibodies. And uh, the, 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 the project uh, is still ongoing. Uh, we are adding about 1,000 new articles a month. So uh, I want to talk about a second thing that I mentioned. Is, uh, uh, you see, uh, Nida mentioned uh, you have uh, this uh, uh, problem of unique identifier. So I thought um, uh, for, for monoclonals and recombinants, uh, if sequence data cannot be released, maybe we can uh, build uh, a unique identifier uh, based on uh, several pieces of information. The first piece will be um, the gene symbol of the immunogen. The second will be the year of when the uh, antibody is produced. The third will be uh, the supplier or the names of the PI. And the fourth will be uh, a sequence number from that uh, uh, lab or that company against that particular um, gene, uh, gene. And the, the last, uh, information uh, would, would be uh, the, the species of the FC fragment or the framework. So that's, that's, my, that's about the database and also the, the, the proposal about uh, making a unique ID for the, for the antibody reagent. long day, and I think um, with all the questions we've had along the evening, I think we're probably good unless anyone has any beer. final comments or whatever. Beer? Yeah. I think it's beer time. Yeah. Any other questions? Do we have time for one? I don't want to keep people from here. Um, <laughs> we can probably... Uh, just uh, in the discussion databases, I wanted to back to a question that was thrown out earlier in a session today, which is about recombinant antibodies and the sequences, and we talked a lot about the IP and that you need to keep it private, but I wonder, speaking of databases, if we could create a separate, it should be a nonprofit, uh, a separate repository that 
every provider that has recovered an antibody submits their sequence to, and there is a triggering event if the company goes out of business, then those sequences become visible. So you still keep all of the IP protection, no one has access to it, and the biomedical journals have the exact same thing in case a journal goes bankrupt so that all of the papers don't disappear, we have the Fox digital library. So creating a database that basically becomes a bank, right, in case of bankruptcy. Um, would there be issues with creating this? Would that be helpful? So it's just a thought. Um, for, for um, in my opinion, I think this would be potentially a very, very, very good um, idea for a, a research resource. Um, but as with all of these things, what you need um, is you need to establish uh, enough trust in that third party. And I think that's one of the main things. Uh, the second thing that you would need is to fund it appropriately. So the question is, um, if we have this, I mean, we just had the biggest data breach in, in you know, history, and, and these things come every other month. So getting that trust into a party that says, you know, we'll take care of your data, um, it's a very, very hard thing when banks are getting breached and when Yahoo is getting breached and Sony and everybody else. So that part is actually very difficult um, to, well, to get that. It, it's pretty common practice right now in software in the software field, escrow. exactly, to hold, to hold you know, software and escrow, right? So there are companies out there that do this right now, and it's, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The solution's already out there. Yeah, no, I completely agree. If this isn't the group that can come up with the solution, then yes, I agree, it's hopeless, but this has been done. We could follow the clocks. Um, we could get antibody providers to have a nominal fee. I mean, this is, we're talking about something that is almost free. Right, to create this, and I, I really think it's doable, and this is something we can put on the agenda that I think will help. You, you obviously need to get producer buy in, right? I mean, that's the, that's, that's, that's the bottom line. That's um, why I'm breaking it up. Yeah, 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 I know, I think, I, think it, I mean, I would prefer complete transparency, but failing complete transparency, uh, an, an accession number would be second best, I think. So, so along the same lines, Everybody offers deposits RNAs, sequencing data, microarray data in the public domain. Uh, the geos of the world exist. Uh, why can't we do the same thing with antibody I mean, it's somebody is working on geo. Somebody we have an established institution that is doing that. It's just an additional function. <coughs> I see a lot of nodding, but nothing will actually. Well, from a supplier standpoint, I mean, this is our IP. So the work that we've done to create a monoclonal antibody and sequence it, we want to keep that as our own internal IP. I just don't see. Yeah, all, all the researchers wanted to keep their RNA data for personal, but the journals insisted, the funding agency insisted, we have to search. So, but as soon as we make it public, anyone can make the antibody. So then there's no. There's no incentive for us to do the work. Anybody can use my data and publish the next paper on it. But I'm supposed to deposit it. But, but we actually have to be for profit. profit. This argument is bollocks. But we're for profit. Okay. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not paying for this space. It's the same question. It's the same question. It's the same question. Because we're all working towards the public good. Whether we are a private institution or an academic fact. But, but I think it has to do goal. with where the, the funding for that yeah. comes from, right? If, if you are taking NIH funding, then, you know, then obviously that information should be available. The journals exist. And journals are not dependent upon funding. So what is there is required is peer pressure. <coughs> That's what is required. I'm, I'm not sure there's enough peer pressure in the yeah. world to, <laughs> to, to make the suppliers release that data. So, so a comment on the, uh, the uh, third party repository, if you can guarantee that will not be hacked by the Russians or the Chinese. Or the, so it's, there's, it's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, I see a lot of legal issues with that idea, so it will be hard to convince legal councils, stockholders, boards of public companies particularly, 
to do that because you're essentially relinquishing the intellectual property of a company or a good piece of it. Uh, that can affect stock valuation, can affect corporate value. So you're, I mean, it's an interesting concept, but how you try to avoid all those things, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't have a good answer. I don't see companies jumping freely and saying, yes, let's do it. Um, we will probably not be the first to jump, I can tell you. Jason, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're all polyclonal, so it's easy to volunteer, right? Yeah. So I, I actually think that once we get a reasonable enforcement mechanism that would ensure primacy of a particular sequence, I think if we're able to get to that point in that the, ensure, sorry. The, the primacy, the, so if you put in your antibody sequence and let's say somebody else you know, tries to register the same thing later. So let's say we live in a, off in a far off world um, where we have an enforcement mechanism to basically make sure that um, your intellectual property is is actually respected across the entire world, then I think we would get to a point where we could release those sequences. We're light but years we're, away from we're not such there a reality. Yet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't exist. I mean, I, I, that's but. Yeah, but I think that's where we need to go in order to have the sequences open. While, while the mic is being transferred, I'm not suggesting that private companies relinquish their heat. In case a company goes bankrupt, then the sequence. So like the small providers that might not be around in two years, if they have sequences, if they disappear, that's it. You cannot get back to that antibody. But it is I think we should continue this at the bar. Um, and I hear you. And I, I, hear, I, hear, I, hear, I, I have the information about the bar. It's the serpent sand bee room. It's the orange arrow on your map. Okay. And then the other important piece of information, we are not meeting here tomorrow morning. We are meeting at Nautilus. It's the green arrow. I have no idea where it is. Follow the green arrow. Um, and we're going to start at 8.30 rather than 8.15 because it's so late and you guys deserve a little bit of a break. So I'll see you at the bar.